Today we'll be creating this tetrahedral soft body simulation in Blender. It works by tetrahedralizing a mesh, setting up distance and volume constraints, and simulating its movement with extended position-based dynamics. The blend file is available through a link in the description, so check that out if you'd like, and let's get into it. First, what is a tetrahedron? It's a three-dimensional triangle. Take a triangle, add a point, connect everything up, and you've got a tetrahedron. How do we tetrahedralize our mesh? There are many different ways, but we'll do it by manually tetrahedralizing a cube and instantiating this cube onto a 3D grid created from our input mesh. You can convert a cube to a collection of five tetrahedrons. So create a cube, delete its faces, duplicate it five times, and then create each tetrahedron manually by deleting unnecessary points and creating faces between the necessary ones. One of the reasons we use tetrahedrons for our soft body simulation is that it is easy to calculate their volume, which we'll need to enforce our volume constraint. For this to work correctly, we need the points of our tetrahedrons to have a specific order. In this case, the order is determined by choosing one of the points as the first, having an index of zero, orienting the camera so that the chosen point is closest and the other three surround it, and then ordering the remaining three points in a clockwise fashion. We do this with the set tet indices geometry node group, which manually sets the point index for each tetrahedron point. Point. The set tet point index for index node group takes in a target index, so the starting index of the point in the tetrahedron, and a tet point index, which is the index that we want it to have. This is then set as the tet point index integer attribute, and then after we've set all of the tet point index attributes, we sort the point elements by that attribute. This makes it so that the tet point index attribute matches up with the actual index attribute of each point. Next, we'll be instantiating this tetrahedralized cube onto a 3D grid created from our input geometry, which is stored as the mesh of the simulation object. We can create a 3D grid by using the mesh to volume node and distribute points in volume node. We set the resolution to size and the voxel size to our grid size parameter. Next comes the actual instantiation of our tetrahedralized cubes onto the 3D grid. So we use a repeat zone to place each of the five cube tetrahedrons on each grid point individually. Really, we want each tetrahedron from the cube to be its own instance. Make sure to check pick instance and set the instance index to the iteration value. Then we store a tet index attribute for each tetrahedron tetrahedron instance so we don't lose that information after using the realize instances node because we'll need the tetrahedron instance index during simulation. For this part to make sense, we need to describe how the simulation works in more detail. There are two main constraints in this simulation, distance constraints and volume constraints. Distance constraints move two points so that they get closer to a target position. Volume constraints move the points of a tetrahedron so that the volume of the tetrahedron moves closer to a target volume. In this simulation, we do this by having two geometries. The first is the collection of tetrahedrons we just created. Notice that there are multiple points where the corners of the tetrahedrons overlap. The second is the collection of points that represent each point where the corners of the tetrahedrons meet. The tetrahedron's geometry is used to enforce the volume constraint, while the point's geometry enforces distance constraints. When the volume constraint is enforced, the overlapping tetrahedron points no longer share a location and associated corner positions must be averaged. The point positions need to be updated to match the position of their associated tetrahedron corners. Next, the distance constraints between points are enforced, and tetrahedron corner groups need to be moved to match the position of their associated points. So that's why during initialization we create a tets geometry and points geometry, as well as store the point index and nearest tet point attributes, which associate each tetrahedron corner with its closest point and vice versa. We also initialize an inverse mass attribute for both tet corner points and distance constraint points. This value is used during simulation to determine how much a given point moves in response to a given constraint. For the tetrahedrons, we initialize a rest volume, which is the target volume each tetrahedron tries to maintain. To calculate the volume of a tetrahedron, we first need to get the positions of the corner points of the tetrahedron. We get each tetrahedron corner point index using the tet index attribute we stored before. Since the tet index attribute 
attribute corresponds to the index of each tetrahedron instance, it is the same for each corner point. But after using the Realize Instances node, the index of each corner point now corresponds to four times its tet index attribute plus its index within the tetrahedron. So we multiply the tet index attribute by four, sample that index as well as three increments above it, and output the resulting positions to the tetrahedron corner positions. Then we use a simple formula to calculate the volume. This works by getting one-sixth the dot product of vector C with the cross product of vectors A and B. Vector C is equal to the fourth corner point position minus the first corner point position. Vector A is equal to the second corner point position minus the first one. And vector B is equal to the third position minus the first one. For the points geometry, we initialize distance constraints by using the edges that connect each point that were inherited from the tetrahedralized cube geometry. This is done with a repeat zone set to the maximum number of edges any point in the points geometry has. We then store distance constraint attributes as 2D vectors with the index of the other point in the constraint as the X component and the target distance in the Y component. Each constraint is named edge underscore neighbor underscore and then the index of the vertices edge we are currently creating a constraint for. In the case that the point we are currently creating a distance constraint for doesn't have the maximum possible number of edge neighbors, we set the neighbor index in the edge neighbor attribute to negative one for each edge index we check over the total number of edges for the given point so that we know to ignore this constraint for this point during the simulation. We then convert the point's mesh to point's geometry because we no longer need the edges and move into the simulation loop. Lastly, we'll store the position as a start position attribute. This is only used when we have self collisions turned on to make sure that points aren't colliding with other points that are their direct neighbors. Next, we translate and rotate our object to the desired orientation using a rotate vector and vector addition node on the position attribute to set the point positions for both the tetrahedron and point geometries. Moving on to the simulation loop, we have a repeat zone nested in a simulation zone that contains the simulation step node group. The iterations of the repeat zone are determined by the number of substeps set in the parameters node group. Within the simulation step, the first thing we do is add forces. The only force we are adding in this simulation is gravity, so we subtract a vector with a small z value scaled by delta time to the current velocity. Also, before changing the positions of any of our points, we want to set the last position attribute to the current position. Then we apply our velocity vector as an offset to the positions of each of our points. This is also scaled by the delta time. Now we want to ensure that our tetrahedron corner positions match up with their corresponding point positions. Since we stored corresponding point indices in the point index attribute, we sample the position at that index from the points geometry and set that to the position of our corner points. We enforce the volume constraint by first calculating the volume correction vectors and then offsetting the position of each tetrahedron corner by its corresponding correction vector. The tet point index integer attribute that we stored before is used to to indicate which corner of the tetrahedron the current point belongs to, and accordingly, which correction vector should be applied to it. After getting the position of each tetrahedron corner point using the get tetrahedron positions node group that we explained previously, we get the volume constraint correction vectors. The basic idea here is to get the normal vector of the triangle opposite each tetrahedron corner point, and move each point along that vector depending on the difference between the current volume and the rest volume of the tetrahedron. If the current volume is larger than the rest volume, then the scale of the correction vector will be negative and the corner point will move towards its opposite triangle. And if the current volume is smaller than the rest volume, the tetrahedron point moves away from its opposite triangle. We get the normal vector of each opposite triangle by using the cross product of vectors formed with the other corners of the tetrahedron. This is why we needed to make sure that the tetrahedron indices were in a specific order during initialization. If we didn't, it's possible that the calculated normal would point in the opposite direction for some of the corners. Once we know the volume difference and the opposite triangle normal vectors, we have to determine the scale of the correction vector. This is determined by the techniques for solving general constraints in extended position-based dynamics. A full description of this is out of scope for this tutorial, but 10-Minute Physics has multiple videos covering this topic masterfully. So if you want to understand the why of this setup, please go watch his videos. Lastly, we'll use the index switch 
each node to get the correction vector that corresponds to the current point's index within the tetrahedron. We stored this index during initialization as the tet point index attribute. After that, we offset the position of the point using the resulting correction vector. After our correction vectors have been applied, tetrahedron corner points that should have the same position have been moved by different correction vectors. So we need to average their position and set them all to that. The main group here is the get point group average position node group, which uses two accumulate field nodes. The first adds up all the point positions within each point index group, and the second gets the total number of tetrahedron corner points within each group. Then we average their positions by dividing the sum of all their positions by the number of points in the group. Then we just set every point position to its corresponding average position. Now that the tetrahedron corner point positions have been averaged, we need to move our points geometry points to their corresponding tetrahedron corner group positions. Since each tetrahedron corner point has the same position as every other corner point in its group, all we need to do is sample the nearest tet point index position that we stored during initialization and set this to the current points geometry point position. Moving on to the distance constraint, we've covered this in previous videos, and what it does is average the correction vector for every distance constraint connected to a given point. We do this by getting every distance constraint correction vector, adding them up, and then dividing them by the total number of correction vectors for this constraint. We keep a count of the number of distance constraints that apply to the current point using the isNeighbor output of the getEdgeCorrectionVector node group. This is because there is a maximum number of distance constraints that apply to any given point, but some points have fewer. In the get edge correction vector node group, we extract the distance constraint attribute, separate it into its x and y components where the index of the point's neighbor and rest length are stored, get the distance between the current point and the neighbor point for this constraint, subtract that length from the rest position, and use that to find the scale of the correction vector which points from the neighbor point to the current point. We also factor in compliance, delta time, and inverse mass because XBBD, and set the vector to zero if this distance constraint doesn't apply to the current point. We know if the constraint applies or not because if it doesn't, we set the neighbor index of the constraint attribute to negative one in the initialization step. So we apply the average correction vector as an offset to the position of the current point, and we are done with the core of the simulation. You can optionally turn on self-collisions by using the collision constraints node group. This node group wraps a repeat zone so that you can increase collision iterations as needed. The collision constraint itself is described in previous videos, so please go check those out to get the details. This group does have one difference in that we only apply the constraint if the colliding point isn't a close neighbor with the current point. We do this by checking whether the distance between the start position attribute of the current point and the position of the colliding point is greater than two times the grid size parameter. If it is, the constraint isn't applied. Collisions with the ground and cylinders work by checking the position of a given point relative to a z position or a line running along the z axis and changing its position if it is below a certain point or closer to the line than the radius of the cylinder. Again, both ground and cylinder collisions are described in detail in previous videos, so please go check those out if you want the details. In the very last step of our simulation, we calculate the new velocity of each point by subtracting the last position from the current position, scaled by 1 over delta time. Optionally, you can add another scale vector node set to something close to 1, like 0.999, if you want the wiggles to calm down faster. And that just about covers it. As always, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, I hope you learned something, and above all, I hope you had fun. Until next time, bye!